Hi everyone, Rachel Gray here. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. I am on my way to 500 subscribers. Yes, that's right, 500 subscribers. And you guys are the one who are getting me there. Please, 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 if you haven't already, please subscribe. Today we are tackling my series on how to choose a career. So the purpose of this series is to let you know that yes, you may have chose this one thing as your major and it doesn't seem like it's working out right now, like in your completely different field and you're like, this isn't how my life was supposed to turn out. It's okay. There's a lot of other people that this also happened to. So this How to Choose a Career series is giving you different people's perspectives and different people's stories on how they found their passion and they united it with their purpose to really become the best version of themselves. Today, I'm going to be interviewing the owner, the founder, the entrepreneur, Sandra. I actually met her in college and I'm really, really excited to share this with you. She has quite the journey and she's an inspiration, not only to me, but I know after this interview, she will be an inspiration to you as well. Let's get started. Andra, thank you so much for taking the time to come on my YouTube channel today. I, I'm so happy that you're here. <laughs> it's good to see you again, honestly. We met at Andrews University, so I kind of want to go back a little bit prior to Andrews University and ask you some questions. Tell me a little bit about yourself, um, who you were growing up. Just give us a little bit of insight. I was born in Ghana, basically. Um, I grew up here, I think, until I was 15. Then I moved to Kenya. I did two years of high school there. And then I moved to the U.S. in Michigan, where I did my high school, um, finished high school there um, at Andrews Academy. And when I finished... I got a bit lazy with my applications. So I had dreams of going to NYU and all of this. And then my senior year, I was like, forget it. There's a university right up here. I'm just gonna go there. <laughs> so I applied to just that one. And that was very risky because if I didn't get it, then I'm just stuck there. Mm -hmm. But luckily I got into that one. And so I went to, I did my um, college degree at Andrews University where we met. Yes. And from there, I moved to Korea to um, work for a year. And I ended up being there for six years instead. <laughs> and um, right now, I'm in Ghana I'm with my dad. Um, I'm loving our time here. I've been here for about a year and a half. And yeah, that's where life is right now. <laughs> Let's go back to maybe high school years, thinking about putting in those applications to NYU. Did you have some type of idea of what you wanted to be when you kind of grew up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I had always wanted to be a pilot or an aeronautic engineer, right? But my family really wanted me to be a doctor. And so I figured, okay, I'll be a doctor. But I knew that I didn't really like the medical field much, right? And so I figured, well, how can I satisfy my family and also do something I like? So I figured that um, laboratory sciences could be the right place for me. And so I had decided I'll do my pre-med and then go to a medical school and then maybe do some laboratory sciences just so everyone is satisfied. But once I started college and I realized that Ugh, I just don't like the medical field. <laughs> it's just not for me. That first bio class, the first C I got on a test in my life, and so I was just like, yeah, I can't do this. <laughs> Did you choose bio as your major? Was that your major originally? Mm -hmm. So I started with bio just because I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything else. I think I was not educated on the process or what else I could do to go into medical school. So I thought bio, but it's just bio, right? So after you got that first C, what did you do? Did you try to change your major? Like what, what was the ending process? I think I changed my major about six times. Actually. Oh, <laughs> walk us through it. Walk us through. What did you change your major to? And then, and so, <laughs> once I started bio, I actually did one semester of it and realized that I hate this. I like, I got sick just being in the class. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I finished that first semester and I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not even doing the second semester of this. And so then I decided, okay, 
I, I love music. Um, I thought I could be an opera singer. <laughs> so I went into music. And so then I started my music degree, did it for one semester. I used to play the French horn. So I thought I'll do both kind of okay. build something up with that. And yeah, that wasn't working out either. And so I quit again. <laughs> And then I, I decided to study languages because it's another thing that I love. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing French, Spanish, and I even did Hebrew, Greek, all of that. And yeah, I just didn't know what I was going to do with that. And so I quit that again. And then I was like, oh, I can become a pastor. I love the Lord. Okay. <laughs> and so I think I want to be a preacher or I want to teach or, you know, just something with religion. And so then I went into the theology department and I started that. And I loved that program. I really loved that program. But halfway through that, I realized I don't really want to be a pastor. Um, maybe I could teach it, but do I want to teach that for the rest of my life? There's something in me that felt like is not really lining up with what I want to be, even though I still didn't know what that was going to be yet. And so I sat down and I was like, okay, let's think about life. I was like, I love people. At that time I was working at the Adventist Ministries as a counselor or chaplain. And so I loved um, being a chaplain. I love counseling people, helping people through the issues. So I was like, oh, maybe psychology is the right thing for me. And so I decided to go into psychology. And so I did psychology and religion, um, those two majors and graduated with both, right? Um, with a goal that I would go work as a counselor. So I'll do my master's and my PhD and become a psychiatrist. Let's pause yeah. the story a little bit here. So uh -huh. I was just telling you that when I arrived at Andrews, mm -hmm. I saw you as like, the head of, of AUSA and she used to wear this like blazer guys and she just used to it just oh, was, you remember blazers I wore. I remember the blazer that's what I remember um and I just used to be in awe of like your presence and who you were and the fact that you were like the AUSA president so talk mm -hmm. me you know we talked about the different majors but then how about the getting involved in like extracurriculars especially at the university talk let's talk about that a little bit yeah I think actually that's where a lot of my energy came from where I really connected with myself and I didn't know then that I actually enjoyed leading and I actually enjoyed being in front of people I, it was something I used to be shy to admit and because I was shy to admit I never pursued anything you know, that put me in front of people a lot. But I'm the kind of people that I'm very uncomfortable with just like hanging out with just one person. Mm -hmm. It's so hard for me. But then you put me in front of like a whole lot of people and I feel like myself immediately, but I didn't know that, right? So it was actually one of the associate deans at Student Life, Dean Buckley. It was my sophomore year and I had just gone through a really hard time in my life, um, digging myself out of like depression and all of that. And it was elections time for AUSA, the student body, the student government. And my roommate was running for a press, something in the press. And she was like, why don't you run for something? And I was like, no one is gonna vote for me. No one even knows who I am. Like, I don't talk to anybody. And so she's like, just run. If you win, you win. If you don't, you have nothing to lose. I'm like, but then I'll embarrass myself in front of everybody, right? And so she took me to Dean Buckley and they sat me down and they talked to me and really encouraged me. I don't think I'll ever forget that moment. I don't really remember a lot of the things that were said, but all I know is that I walked out of that room and I was like, I'm applying for vice president of AUSA, I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> and so I went ahead and applied for it and started running for it, right? And then came the time of the speech and I gave my speech. I was actually feeling very intimidated because it was my first time um, since being in the US. And so it was packed, everyone was there, like the whole student body was there and I was giving the speech, I remember. And I just gave a speech and I walked out and people were, were just like, you are so regal, you are so this. I think it was the first time that people actually saw me. And I felt like, oh, 
people see me, <laughs> you know, and that thing. And I started feeling like, oh, I could have some influence. And so then I really started pushing for it. I won that, became the vice president for a year, and I enjoyed my time. I think it was one of the best years of my life because I really got to do things outside of class. Mm. And it was then that I realized that even though I love education, the type of education I, that brought me, made me feel alive was very different from just sitting in the classroom and listening to someone you know, talk at me. I really enjoyed hands-on things, right? Or being with people, collaborating and stuff like that. And so then I decided to run for president after that. So I think it was mostly like the influence of people seeing me before I even saw myself or seeing that I had some potential before I even recognized that I had any type of, you know, potential. So let's go back to your career now. You graduated from Andrews with mm -hmm. psychology and religion, mm -hmm. and then you moved to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along there, you get your MBA. Now, mm -hmm. walk us through that story. Mm -hmm. How, because your plan was to then, as you said, go to get your master's and then your PhD. So how did you, you switch to kind of go the business path? Yeah, you know, I think um, before I come to that, I'm realizing now that sometimes the things we become, we've always been or we've always aspired to in our hearts somehow, and we just didn't recognize it. Um, because sometimes society and stuff pushes us towards something so different from who we are, right? Ever since I was a child, I always admired one thing, and that was powerfully dressed women on TV. And how I saw that was through CSI or like dramas like that or movies like that. And I always aspired to be that woman dressed up to the T, walking powerfully or somewhere, like just in a and that's group. how I saw you. Oh, that's, wow. funny because that's <laughs> how I saw you at Andrews University as ASA president. That's why I keep saying the blazer. Oh, uh, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like those women had a walk about them. They had a talk, like everything they did. And I, I always saw my, that picture you know, myself in that picture, but it never connected. Everyone was like, you're gonna do this and you're gonna become this. Oh, you'll be so good at this and stuff. I never took the time to look at myself. And so I went to Korea after graduating. I was working there as a teacher, an English teacher, and also as their, basically their HR person, um, administrative supervisor. So basically I was recruiting people from seven countries and training them to work in Korea for like the institutions there. And while I was doing that, I realized that I love business. I love, you know, the business aspect of it. I realized also that I think really quickly on my feet, you know, all these things that could um, maybe help me develop a business on my own. At that time, I still didn't know what it was going to be in. And that picture of me being in a corporate world, you know, in a powerful meeting room <laughs> with you know people making decisions so then I decided you know what I'm gonna be in business I don't know what but I'm gonna be in business let me go get my MBA and at the time the person I was dating I was like oh he had a name for himself so I the plan was to be the business person because we thought we we're gonna get married be the business person for that you know marriage and basically build the businesses you know in the background and so then I come back to Korea because at this time I also wanted to be a professor <laughs> and so I decided to pursue that and so it was when I started working as a professor I had some time um, so I was like oh maybe I can develop a business for myself this is the time that's when I really started digging deep into what it is that I want to do something that I want to start that could be forever. How did you then settle on fashion design? Because I know we talked <laughs> about thinking about women as powerful, but then how did it come to the forefront of your mind? Like, hey, I, I want to have my business centered around fashion design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it actually started with an idea I got while I was in business school. <laughs> and so... I had wanted to start a foundation in Ghana um, to kind of 
honor my parents. I love my parents dearly. And so, um, and growing up, I had always seen them kind of help people, you know, along the way. And so I wanted to build a foundation to honor that where we actually gave people vocational training and sewing, um, you know, leather work and all of that so that they could also have businesses on their, of their own to kind of help their generation. So it was really targeted at like underprivileged communities in Ghana. Um, but I tried to make that possible by, you know, writing a lot of proposals, asking for money, fundraising and all of that. And it didn't work out. So I had forgotten about that. And so during the time when I was thinking of what to do, the idea came back to me because one of my professors mentioned that, you know, maybe if you're not able to find funding for that project, you can build a business that will eventually fund that pro uh, program, even though that is going to be a much longer process. So I decided then after, you know, during the time of looking at what to do, oh, if I was going to train people in fashion, I could start a business in fashion. But at that time, I hadn't even recognized how much I loved fashion myself. And so I spoke to my best friends and they were all like, totally, because I've never had like a small closet. All my closets are always like overflowing. But I think starting the business is more than that, right? Now I had to learn the process. I had to learn everything. But the most important thing was now I had recognized this is something I love. And if this company becomes successful, it is something I will enjoy doing for life. Because just talking about it, I had energy. I had like, I felt, finally felt like something was aligning. And I could see myself in those powerful rooms, you know, with these powerful women and dressing for these powerful women. And so then that's kind of what gave me the idea to go into the fashion business, even though I had very little education <laughs> in that view. Do you feel at that moment, your passion united with your purpose? I Would think you so. It is. I want to talk about the workforce because I'm curious. So the workforce in Korea, Chicago, Ghana, how is that different? And how, what is it like navigating from one culture to the next? They're very different. I think it's something I'm still learning. When I came to Ghana, obviously for my family first, I also wanted to start um, the business here. But now I'm realizing that it's very different from what you know, I had had in mind or what I'm used to. And so I'm deciding to postpone that for a different time when I'm ready for it, because otherwise it's just going to be waste of money, waste of time, waste of resources and everything. Navigating through all of that, one thing has taught me about business is that one is different everywhere and you have to be aware of the environment you want to build something in. But two, that when you can start something, but also be willing and very resilient in the fact that it's not, always going to work out doesn't mean it will never work out but you need to learn to step back let some things go to reprogram or strategize but each country is different because cultures are different people accept things differently um, people enjoy different types of clothing <laughs> in the fashion world in each country and so it's not always cut across now i want to get into your entire journey so you have come from Ghana, to Kenya, to Michigan, to Korea, to Chicago, to Ghana again. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that along the path, you've had obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I see you now shining in the sunlight. So <laughs> you have to have been resilient through these obstacles and to be here right now. You talked a little bit about depression, but I kind of want to know what is it that what is it that you hold on to in the times when you don't want to wake up in the morning because everything's gone wrong, right? Mm -hmm. What do you hold on to? If I'm being real, I mean, I can just tell you, I hold on to God and everyone will be like, amen. But that's really not reality. It may be other people's reality, but that was not mine. Um, because most of those times when I was going through a hard time, I was really angry at God, you know? And so I had to navigate the emotions of being angry at whatever situation was going on and being angry at the one person I had always been taught to trust. That can be a very, I think, lonely and dark spot, you know. I don't remember that I held on to something specifically. And in those moments when I gave up, it was complete. 
numbness where you feel like you have nothing to really fight for anymore. And so I think what really used to help me was that I didn't want to stay there because my parents always knew I was going to be something special and they grilled that into my soul. And if I know the plans I have for you, my dad always grilled that into me, you know, plans to make you prosper and all of these. And so I knew I was supposed to prosper. I was supposed to be successful. I was supposed to have a bright future. And for some reason, no matter how low I got, that was always playing in the back of my mind. And so I think sometimes it's really important what we tell people, you know, because sometimes it can become the only thing they hang on to. But when again, to point where I feel like I just wanted to give up everything, like what's the purpose of all of this? I, that always played in the back of my mind. And then I got angry because that's related to God and he's a person I'm angry <laughs> at right now. But it always, sometimes I rely on myself and just be like, but I can still achieve something. And I get into this manic phase of trying to figure out what that is, <laughs> right? And maybe when something's not working and I get into that, I have to get out of this mode. And then I go in through like literally like a week of mania where <laughs> it's like, what is it? What can I do? And I don't know if it's healthy or what, but it's how I process those moments. I didn't want to give up. Um, I think in those moments, my parents became the reason why I got up, you know, and did what I had to do because they worked really hard for me to, for to see this bright future. But eventually that also became my own mantra where I was just like, I have to, like, I have a, some lives to empower. I have to empower myself and other people around myself, uh, around me. Recently though, I'm leaning back on God, <laughs> you know, and I'm beginning to allow him and giving him some of, you know, the issues. And that's been very calming that when like this year, 2020 has been a lot, you know, but it was just after I go through like a week of depression, I come back to the point that breathe, God's got this and you're going to figure it out. Also just looking at the past and realizing that, wow, when this thing happened, it was so big in my life at that time, mm -hmm. but I overcame it, right? And this one right now might be really painful, even debilitating, but I can overcome it the same way I did that, right? And so just reminding myself of the things I've been through and how I don't even feel them now, I don't even think about them now, makes me feel like I can be feeling the same way about this situation in the future and not to give up. Right. I love how you make it very authentic that even right now, right, mm -hmm. even after you've been through so much, you still have those moments because mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes we feel like once we get through challenges, we'll reach this height and then we'll plateau. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the funny thing I'm realizing, I think sometimes we all want to be this superwoman or we, we want to be at this level because we feel like once we've reached there all our issues are over mm. but i'm realizing that the more responsibility i get the bigger the disappointments and the bigger the heartache and the bigger the depression when things don't work out because now you're not just dealing with yourself and your little you know part-time work money you're not dealing with in my case a company the finances that can go into that you can lo lose thousands overnight you know compared to you losing like a couple hundred during college, you know? So now your responsibilities are bigger and the pain is bigger, mm -hmm. you know? And so the higher you go, the deeper those things can get. But I think it's important how we deal with the little ones now as we go, because that really helps us learn how to balance, you know, things when the big ones come. During this interview, you have taught me so much, um, and I'm sure you've taught so many other people so much, but I want you to give some words of advice to maybe that person who thought that they were going to be a psychologist, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't, you know, it didn't seem like it's, it's working out, and they're trying everything. Can you give some advice to that girl, your past self even, um, yeah. give some advice to her? Yeah, I think it's um, all I'll say is really don't stress it so much 
that doesn't even make sense because it is stressful, right? But don't depend on the stress or don't live on the stress. And I say that because I think most of us, we get comfortable mm -hmm. living in that stage of despair, stress. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm trying everything and it's not gonna work out. You know, and then we enjoy living there without realizing, right? We get comfortable. And so then we start accepting whatever is coming because, well, this is what I can get. I did all those interviews and nothing worked out. So this is what I found, I'm gonna do this. And we get stuck there and we feel like that's all we can do. Meanwhile, there's a part of us, and I think this is what causes the pain. There's a part of us that is still fighting for us to be better, right? And I think, listen to that part a little bit. It can be slow, but listen to it and really start trying to figure out what are the things you do that make, like, bring you joy. As long as someone mentions that, you light up. Find that. And when you find that, think of things you can do around that. You don't need to become an entrepreneur, but now you can reroute your career path that way. And trust me, I, was, I found this research, I don't remember the exact um, percentage, but most people do not end up doing what they went to school for. So it's not just you. So I think what I'll tell that person is keep fighting, don't give up on yourself. There's a place your heart wants to be fight for that. And until it lands on it and you feel like something has connected because you will feel it. Because now when you're stopping that thing, it's like breaking up with, <laughs> with your soul or with something really important. It connects for you. And no matter, it's not easy. Because, oh, I love fashion doesn't mean the job is easy. Mm. But I realized that I will wake up for this job any day, every day, mm. compared to something else I'm doing that I'll be dragging my feet at, right? So look for that thing that makes you get that ding, you know, <laughs> thing over there and start pursuing it no matter how scary it is. Start reading, start searching and don't get comfortable in the pain. Feel it, recognize it, you know, but don't get comfortable there. Thank you so much for your time. This has been amazing. You have brought us through your entire journey. And up to this point, we've learned so much. Thank you so much. Love you.